on that such said, my name is Sonia Gupta. Before I became a developer, uh, I was a lawyer in southern Louisiana. Uh, and I practiced mostly as a public defender, um, but then I became a prosecutor. So I was a public defender in New Orleans, uh, not too long after Hurricane Katrina, actually. And today is the, what, it'll be the 13th anniversary of the day that uh, Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans. Uh, so after that, then I became a prosecutor, then I was an assistant attorney general for the state of Louisiana, doing federal civil rights defense work um, and towards litigation. So spent most of my career doing that. Uh, then I decided, hey, let's make life difficult, do something incredibly challenging, and uh, packed up my car, moved, to New Orleans, uh, moved from New Orleans to Denver, um, and enrolled at a code school called Turing and became a software developer, and have been working as a software developer ever since. I've also done a um, good bit of dabbling in infrastructure lately, so I'm really excited to kind of talk about some of those things today. So, I guess I should turn this on, right? That would help. All right. So, this first slide, I know it's just a wall of words right now, but there are a couple of things um, that I want to sort of draw your attention to. So as a lawyer, we are taught about ethics from the get-go. Um, it's the first thing that we learn um, in our first year of law school. We have uh, professional responsibility courses, uh, and then before we're able to practice law, uh, in addition to the bar exam, we have to take a multi-state professional responsibility exam. And then for every year that you practice, for the rest of your life, you have to take ethics courses, um, continuing legal education ethics courses. So when I, when I was sworn in as a lawyer, I took an oath um, in the state of Louisiana, in the Supreme Court, and this is the text of uh, that oath. And there are a couple of really um, interesting parts that I want to bring up about it. Uh, the first one being, I will not counsel or maintain any suit or proceeding which shall appear to me to be unjust, nor any defense except such that I believe to be honestly debatable under the law of the land. So basically, this is saying, don't be an asset. <laughs> don't do bad things. Um, don't do things that you know are unjust. Don't pursue uh, cases that you know to be uh, unworthy of the courts. Uh, and then there's another one, actually, that I think is really good. It's the last line. Um, I will never reject from any consideration, personal to myself, the cause of the defenseless or oppressed or delay any person's cause for lucre or malice. And what that's saying is, again, don't be an asshole. But not only don't be an asshole, be good. Um, so look toward, um, look forward, um, be proactive in helping humanity. Don't just do things that are there for your own benefit. Uh, so a lot of professions have these kinds of codes. Uh, the medical profession also has uh, a Hippocratic Oath. Um, there's a really old-fashioned version of it, and it's been modernized a lot. And it has a couple, a few really good points. Uh, one of them is, I will apply for the benefit of the sick all measures that are required, avoiding those twin traps of overtreatment and therapeutic mechanism. I really like that line because it, it reminds me a lot about over-engineering and under-engineering. So you want to make sure, as, as, a, as a physician, not to fall into those traps, but also as a DevOps engineer or a software developer. Uh, and then this second one was really great. It's something that I see a lot in our industry. Above all, I must not play at God. So keep that in mind, humility, right? Um, you are not building something um, like as God. You're building something as a human with human frailties for the rest of humanity. So to keep that in mind. And then the final point I think I like from the, the Hippocratic Oath is that I will remember that I remain a member of society with special obligations to all my fellow human beings, those sound in mind and body as well as the infirm. That needs to be something that you think about every day as a developer in all of the work that you do, whether you're a software developer, um, an infrastructure engineer, or doing anything related to tech at all. That you are not just building a product, you are a steward of humanity, and that is becoming abundantly clear. We have other professions that we can look to for some guidelines, um, like law and medicine, but this is an obligation that we all have to take very seriously every day, and we should start thinking about it now. So let's ask about, you know, I was wondering, where does tech stand as an industry when it comes to ethics? So of course I did the scientific thing and conducted a Twitter poll, uh, and I got almost 700 replies to this. Um, 683 respondents. And what they responded is almost 70% of people had no formal education in ethics and are just, we're just writing software. We're building infrastructure, we're increasing automation, and we're doing all sorts of things without any understanding of our ethical obligations or what ethics even is. So, 30 minute talk, 
might be 35, uh, it's probably not long enough to really delve into what our ethical obligations are, but I'm hoping I can get you to think about it in a more philosophical and holistic way as something that you are going to take back with you and think about with every line of code that you write. So, let's ask, what is ethics anyway? Uh, the Marcola Center for Ethics at Santa Clara University came up with a really decent definition. You'll probably find a lot of definitions, but this one seems to make a lot of sense. So it's, it's a two-part definition. Um, the well-founded standards of right and wrong that prescribe what humans ought to do, usually in terms of rights, obligations, benefits to society, fairness, or specific virtues. So I think some of the important parts of this are the well-founded standards. We are talking about process that has been defined um, that we are all going to adhere to. And kind of starting to sound a bit like uh, the work that we do as uh, DevOps engineers, right? Um, and then the other component of this, what humans ought to do. So this is not just uh, a bare minimum standard, right? There is a difference between the law and ethics. The law is generally proscriptive, saying at a bare minimum, do not do these things. But what ethics is saying is, do not do these things, but also be better, right? Do better, um, create more, um, and be more effective as a human. Don't just avoid bad things. Uh, and then the second part of this definition is that ethics is the study and development of one's ethical standards. And the interesting part of this, the, the study and development. What this presupposes is that ethics is not fixed. It's not something that we just live with, we learn, and then we let it go. Back in the day, right, our ethical version of life was very different than what it is now. It used to be ethical to own human beings. People didn't seem to have a problem with that. Um, ethics changes and evolves, and we as an industry also have to take that into account, how our ethics as an industry change. So I think what's really interesting is to kind of understand how we got to this point when we think about digital ethics. Um, ethics as a science or as a social science has existed since ancient Greece. Um, but digital ethics is not something that really came to the fore until post-World War II. So there was this fellow, Norbert Wiener, uh, who wrote this book called Cybernetics. And it sounds like something out of Scientology or out of a science fiction film, but it's actually a real thing. Um, and uh, he started to develop this idea of digital ethics in the context of post-World War II technology. So he was a mathematician um, and a philosopher uh, who was a math professor at MIT. And he studied under some really influential philosophers, including Bertrand Russell. And after, uh, well, during World War II, he worked on automating anti-aircraft guns. Um, weapons. And so he was building this technology. And in, in 1948, he kind of, after having done all this work, was understanding that the work that he had done in automation um, was harmful to humanity. So he started to move towards understanding his ethical obligation and started to study um, information theory. So information theory, very loosely, um, it studies the transmission and use of information. Right? There are a, lot, a whole lot of schools of thought behind what information theory is. Uh, but he became interested in that, and then he developed his own information theory called cybernetics. Um, so let's talk about how cybernetics relates to digital ethics. So there's there's no he's been very happy with himself, and he should, because he made a pretty significant contribution to the way that we understand our world, whether you know it or not. And I didn't know it until I started researching this. So what is cybernetics? At a very high level, it is how living organisms communicate with each other, but it's also how machines communicate with each other. Um, and we're going to kind of understand how the two overlap. So on, uh, when we're talking about this communication, we're talking about how information is harvested, transmitted, and processed. And then the feedback that is rendered. This sounds a lot like the work that we do, right? Um, we are using information, we are processing information, we are sending it to various parts of our distributed systems, and then we're getting feedback. Uh, he also kind of understood that biology, so if we look at biological systems, they tend towards compartmentalization. Think about the human cell, right? The cell is one of the purest, most beautiful compartments you can think of. It is a microservice, and it communicates with other microservices. And they all have a protocol that they communicate with. Um, we, as humans, right, we are compartmentalized entities that communicate in a system. So, Norbert Wiener understood that efficient interaction depends upon established rules of communication between these separate entities. Um, and he also understood that when you're talking about humans, and we're going to talk about machines, but for now, when we're talking about humans, us as developers, but also 
humanity that, humanity that we serve, um, that these interactions, uh, that moral right and wrong derives from discerning which of our interactions are beneficial to the whole and which are detrimental, and that our actual end goal is to achieve homeostasis. And that's the same thing we want in any distributed system as well, right? We don't want chaos. We don't want a microservice that's broken that doesn't know how to communicate with another microservice, and we scale so large that we can't understand where things broke. We need to achieve homeostasis in those systems, but we're also trying to achieve homeostasis as humans working together in the system. So, Norbert Wiener did this in 1948. And then what you would, what you would see happen with digital ethics is that there, was, there, there would be these spikes of interest that corresponded historically to technological advancements. So, uh, in the mid-2000s, um, probably coinciding somewhere with the dot-com boom or maybe the crash, um, this fellow named Luciano Floridi came up with an idea that supplemented uh, our understanding of digital ethics. And he wanted it to apply to all types of ethics, human, digital, um, and any other kind of ethics, bioethics, legal ethics. Uh, he called it um, information ethics, and I think it's known as Floridian information ethics now. And what he described was that we have to have an understanding on a basic level about the entities that we're talking about that interact. Um, and that whether they're organisms, living organisms or machine, they have two things. Um, and now, I think these things will probably remind you of some of the work that we do. Uh, they have data structures that describe the nature of the object, right, so the state um, and attributes. And then they have operations or functions that are activated by interaction with other entities in the system. Um, so interaction with other objects um, are dictated by these operations. So we probably see some similarities here with object-oriented programming at a minimum, but also the infrastructure that we build. So they're probably tying all this together a bit. Um, some ethical considerations for machines and distributed systems. So as I was thinking about this, I was thinking, you know, it's a little disingenuous to say that the machine itself can be ethical at this point. We may not be there yet, um, but we will be. And if we look at cybernetics and we look at this continued move towards automation and compartmentalization, we are in fact mimicking these same biological systems. And so information ethics becomes machine ethics as well. It's not just human. So let's think about the differences between uh, this old monolith right, that we've been using versus this new distributed system that we're using. So monolith probably has easier visibility into your code interactions. I, as a developer, can enter the code base, look through a few files, and kind of get a feeling for how things interact. With a distributed system, you're encountering obviously some different difficulties. It's less transparent. So the whole point of that distributed system, right, is that I could have a microservice that could function on its own and evolve on its own and not necessarily break the whole system if something went wrong and not necessarily be dependent on other parts of the system. But what that does is introduce, obviously, a lack of transparency. So if I am you know, unfamiliar with the 500 microservice my company built, then I'm kind of at a loss, right? So there, there are trade-offs there. Another thing that you'll find with the monolith, um, and if we're talking about the differences between these, these distributed systems um, and kind of a localized system, uh, is that you have lost your centralized locus of control when you're dealing with a distributed system. Um, a monolith obviously has multiple individual contributors, but everything is happening in one place. Your infrastructure is probably much more localized. So when you're dealing with a distributed system, that locus of control is now gone. And this is part of the reason why DevOps exists, right? Is that we needed a place to put some level of control when we started building distributed systems. So you have a lot of scattered entities, these compartments, right, containers, <laughs> um, that are trying to interact with each other, and we want to achieve homeostasis, but now our infrastructure is distributed. Um, and then you even have a cloud-based infrastructure, which introduces a whole other level of abstraction. Some other differences with a monolith versus a distributed system. Uh, in a monolith, you're probably going to have you're probably going to have less tooling, right? You are not going to necessarily need to use something like Terraform, um, and it's probably a bad idea to use Docker on a huge monolith because everybody's going to be really upset with you when they try to run it and constantly have problems just getting their environment going. Um, so you have more direct control uh, with a distributed system, especially when you're talking about containerization and orchestration. You are dealing with automation with tools like Terraform, and that creates a whole other level of abstraction. So you're automating your automation in a lot of ways. Um, and this is going to affect the way all of these independent entities 
um, interact with each other. So I know this is kind of like, what does this have to do with ethics? So I, want to, I want to remind you to keep thinking about um, the way systems interact, right? And the way that individual entities interact, and that this is the basis for needing ethics, is because these discrete entities are interacting with each other. Um, and then, you know, there's some, obviously, some human, more human oriented considerations when we think about um, the way that our systems and our computing is becoming more distributed. So let's talk about third party APIs. Are you responsible for what happens in a third party API? What data are you sending to them? What are they doing with that data? Um, those are, are you responsible for that? We haven't answered those questions yet as a profession. Um, the law might say maybe so, maybe not. There's a concept called proximate cause in the law, which indicates that in certain situations, should, if you should have known that a sequence of events might happen, then yeah, you might be responsible. So these are things that we need to start thinking about. Some of the things we are thinking about and kind of take for granted um, that are actually ethical um, are issues of security and privacy. But the way that we frame them, the way that we tend to think about them, is purely profit-driven. It's all financial-based. It's not profitable to build an insecure application. It's not profitable to you know, share all of our users' data with the world, right? We tend to think in those terms. We don't tend to think of it in ethical terms. Um, and maybe there needs to be a shift towards that, right? So there are also you know, some considerations uh, when we're thinking about who we are as humans building, uh, building these systems, right? Uh, so what kind of product are we building? That's the number one thing. Are you building something that is going to be harmful to humanity? And that's obviously a very loaded question. What does that mean? And that's why ethical standards matter, right? Um, one of the reasons that ethical standards are really useful in professions and will be useful in our profession is that they take away the mental overhead of having to make a decision in the heat of the moment. Like Andrew mentioned, he said, you know, given the choice between doing something easy and what's right, we're probably going to pick what's easy. Um, and that's true. And that, that's true for ethical considerations as well. When you're under the gun and when you're under pressure from investors, um, when you're under pressure from your, your CEO who wants to push out a product without really understanding points of failure or ethical issues, you're going to be put in a position where you're going to have to make those decisions. So having ethical guidelines in place and understanding the underpinnings of ethical systems will help you to make those decisions when you might be inclined to make less ethical decisions. So other things, uh, who is using our products? So I'm not going to go through like, the litany of horrible things that have happened in the last several months, um, things like you know, Microsoft and ICE, right? You want to wonder, though, as a developer, who is using your product, and do you have an ethical obligation to be interested in that? I would say yes, um, because remember, ethics is not just about a legal baseline. It is about elevating us as an industry, and it's about elevating our behavior and understanding that we have an obligation to humanity as a whole. So ask those questions of your own products. Um, Another thing, who are we sharing user information with? And this kind of came up with, with an API, but as we come to more, uh, as our systems become more distributed and our user information becomes more scattered, it becomes more vulnerable, but also who are we, what is the purpose of collecting our user information? Are we sharing it with unethical parties and is that going to create a conflict of interest for us in the kind of work that we do? I mean, it's kind of an old adage, if you're not paying for the product, then you are the product, right? And we look at the kind of information that's being collected you know, by, for example, social media, or by any of these products that a lot of us use. The whole Google ecosystem is built upon us as a product. So what, is, what are we doing with that information? Who is using that information? And are they using it for you know, unethical purposes? These are questions that we have to ask ourselves. This is no longer something that we can pawn off on someone else. And I'm mean, going you know, to say, and I, this is something that I think about a lot in my work, and I, I think we all need to think about it every day, that you're not just a DevOps engineer, you're not just a software developer, you are someone who's building things that have a huge impact on the entire world. We're able to sort of abstract ourselves away because we're, we're working with machines, and the work that we do is behind a laptop most of the time. We're not directly interfacing with humans often, the way that lawyers and doctors are. So when I was a lawyer, I knew that my obligation was front and center, was right there as that person I was talking to. Um, but as a developer, it can be very easy to lose sight of that, because we're interacting largely with each other, and we're interacting with our machines. We're not seeing what's happening with our end users a lot. Uh, another aspect, I think, of, of ethical uh, development is, is our product accessible to all of our users? That's something I think that we're becoming more aware of, but probably need to be more aware of. Uh, 
um, and it's something that I think we should, should always be harping on. Technical debt is, a, is an actually an ethical issue. So having created so much technical debt that now it's a barrier to actually being ethical, right? This comes to making that easy decision rather than the right decision. Having built in so much technical debt into our product that we can no longer make decisions that are based on ethics, but now we have to just make decisions based on profit and speed. Um, that's a consideration that you need to think about when you're thinking about your technical debt. Um, and then, are we automating ourselves out of accountability? So the driverless car problem definitely applies um, to DevOps. It applies to automation engineering. It applies to all of the work that we do. The more that we abstract ourselves away from the processes that we are building and the processes that we use, the, the easier it becomes to sort of push that ethical work and that ethical obligation off onto a machine. And we're not there yet. We don't have systems in place to handle that. So the more automation we engage in, the more we distance ourselves from our ethical obligations, and that's something we absolutely need to be very conscientious about. Um, and then finally, you know, are we too distanced from our end users to make any ethical decisions in the first place? As our organizations grow, as the work that we do grows, and in fact, DevOps is going to be a huge part of this, as we continue to automate and build services that are um, more, more sort of uh, discrete and kind of broken off from these larger processes, uh, we become less sort of attached and we have less of an understanding of how our end users are using them. So, I have, you know, some thoughts and solutions. We can't just leave this talk with, this is ethics, you're doing everything wrong. <laughs> I mean, I could, but you probably wouldn't like me very much. So, my first suggestion, stop moving fast and breaking things. This is something that we've had drilled into our heads. I've been coming into this industry, and I have come into this industry as an outsider, as someone who used products but didn't deeply understand them in the way that I now do, having been in this industry for a while now, and having built these products. It's very, very easy to just internalize that ethos, because that's what we've been sold by Silicon Valley, and that's what we've been sold by CEOs and investors, that we have to move fast and break things. That's the antithesis of ethical work. Other industries, like law and medicine, have built in safeguards to prevent this moving fast and breaking things. The law has an appeals process. It acknowledges that maybe you went to trial and you lost. Maybe that system wasn't perfect. So we're going to give you multiple levels of appeals. This slows things down, but it also ensures that things are done properly. So these are, these are the kinds of things that we need to consider as developers when we adopt this very dangerous ethos that I think probably needs to die like yesterday. Uh, another thing, um, is that other professions recognize that maximizing profit isn't the end all and be all, right? As a lawyer, perhaps I could make some seriously unethical decisions and make a lot of bank. I could make tons of money. But I would be breaking my ethical obligation, would probably be disbarred, maybe thrown in jail. So profit maximization is that's another part of the ethos that we've all been kind of told that we have to buy into. I'd encourage you internally as a human being to question that, but also as a developer to feel like you can question that in your work and the companies that you work for. Uh, initial education and mandatory early training. So like lawyers and like doctors, to have this idea of ethics become so deeply ingrained in everything that we do that it is at the forefront of our minds when we go to work in every line of code that we write, in every feature that we build, in every level of abstraction that we adopt. I mean, don't just build microservices just because they're cool, right? You want to do this ethically, you want to do this well. So to question that. So education, um, at a fundamental level, when you're either if it's through traditional means as a computer science undergrad or even through a code school, to have that education drilled in early, um, but also to have it maintained, right? This is not something that you set and forget. And in some of the replies to my poll, people were saying, yeah, you know, I received some education in ethics, but are we ever continuing that? Probably not, right? People aren't refreshing that information and updating it because these codes of ethics, like I said, need to develop according to social mores and according to the technologies that we're using. And this is the one that's kind of scary. It's a suggestion, external regulation, right? There is a lot about our industry that wants to be independent of government, you know, governmental intervention, but there are times when that's necessary if we can't self-regulate. And we are having that debate right now, and it's a thing that we need to consider very seriously. I don't know if given like, the current state of our government, if I want this government to regulate our industry. <laughs> but, but this external regulation, this idea of another source, and that might be self-regulation, but that we build our own entities, 
that are going to regulate. Do you know what that means? Sometimes the things that we think should be private are not going to be private anymore. So your intellectual property, if it is a problematic algorithm, it will be reviewed by an external agency to determine whether or not it's safe and ethical. That's just going to be a thing we have to do. That's what lawyers have to go through. My like, work product is not private. Any regulatory board can look at it. Um, doctors have to deal with this too with medical malpractice boards, right? So we need to kind of like suck it up and accept that might become an eventuality. Um, and then, this idea that you're accountable to humanity, right, not just the company, um, this is something that I think needs to be more of a human value than um, just, a, you know, uh, an engineering specific value. But you as a human who walk out of this room and interact with other humans, we're all, you know, working together with some basic ethical understanding, right, that it's probably better for us to not just, like, murder each other because society would collapse if we did that. So we have some ethical, you know, and legal restrictions in place to to prevent that. But also, when you're, when, you're, when you're going to work, you're not just working for the company. Remember, the thing that you're building is going to end up in the world and in the hands of people that could either use it maliciously um, or not understand it or even be hurt by it. So keep that, that a very important thing in mind. Um, but you know what? I'm talking about ethics. I'm talking about let's have you know, guidelines. Let's build these systems. Let's train ourselves. Let's have regulatory agencies. And, and then it occurred to me that actually none of that matters. We can do that all that we want. We can do it every day. But if we don't fix this one thing, um, then none of that matters. It's all going to still be broken. Because if we build systems inside of broken systems, those systems will be broken. And the rules that we build will only apply to some people and not to everybody. So this is actually what we're talking about. This is the thing I think about every day. I wake up in the morning and I go to bed thinking about it. And if you follow me on Twitter, you will know that that is true. This right here is the scourge of our entire industry. This is the scourge of our country. And this is the scourge of our planet right now. If we build ethical systems, if we build codes of ethics, for example, the um, Association, uh, the American Computing, Association of Computing Machinery, ACM, uh, updated recently their ethical code. And a lot of people talk about it in talks. Like it's so great. Well, I went and looked at their task force. Their task force consists of 25 people. Of those 25 people, one is a person of color, and that is a man of South Asian descent. How can an industry come up with ethical standards if we're not actually accounting for disabled people, people of color, um, people who are uh, along the gender spectrum? How? We can't, possibly. Like, you cannot write ethical codes if you're not accounting for all of humanity. So I'm not just talking about the default of a white man being protected by ethical codes. I'm talking about all of us, because everybody's using our products. Uh, and then the other part of this, too, is that even if we do build those codes, um, are they going to be applied equally across our industry? So if some people commit ethical violations and other people commit ethical violations, are those two people going to be treated the same? Right? Is Mark Zuckerberg going to get you know, the same kind of uh, sort of, um, is he going to be addressed the same way if he commits an ethical violation versus like an up-and-coming black woman who's building her own company? If we have systems that are still built and rooted in white supremacy, the answer is no. Ethics and law may be very different, but if they're codified, they operate the same. So I saw this every day as a public defender and a prosecutor. I saw unequal application of law and policy, and so anytime someone tries to tell me, ah, oh, we've achieved parity, the Civil Rights Act happened, I look around my world and I see that's a whole lot of bullshit. Because I see unequal application of standards to certain individuals, and no application of it whatsoever to others. So as long as we are still women in these broken systems, in white supremacy, nothing we do no building of ethical systems or standards is actually going to change anything. And so that's the work that we all have to do collectively. A big surprise to all of you, you might find this offensive, every single one of us is living in a white supremacist system. We've all been indoctrinated into it from the day that we were born. It treats us differently and our behaviors are different based upon where we are along the spectrum, where we are in the position of that hierarchy. If you are a white man, white supremacy is gonna treat you very differently than if you were a black woman. And that is a thing that you need to internalize and understand on a daily basis. It literally has to become part of your, like, your ethos, your personal, like, who you are when you go to work, when you go to bed, when you interact with people. And so part of this work that we have to do is understanding that that hierarchy exists, understanding that we've all been indoctrinated in it, 
as developers, as humans, and as stewards of humanity, which is what we have now become as developers. So, you know, systems of oppression don't dismantle themselves. Uh, they, they just persist, right, as long as people are willing to let them. And the people who are subject to that oppression can, all, can also not dismantle those systems. The people that created them are the people that have to dismantle them. And that is why I ask all of you, especially white people in this audience, that this is your work to do. This is something you have to do. You can't be an ethical developer if you are still living in a white supremacist system. It's just the two do not, do not work together. So we can learn about it and not accomplish anything if we don't dismantle these systems. So I got you know, some resources for you. If you are like, I am a white person, what do I do? You just told me I have to fix this shit. How do I start? Well, a couple of things that you can do. These are, these are resources that are about the whole ethics issue, but also dealing with specifically white supremacy as uh, a system that we live in. First thing you can do is like learn and listen, right? Um, one of the resources that I find to be really powerful is a book called White Fragility by Robin D'Angelo. It's a very recent publication. Everybody should read it, people of color and white people, um, because you will learn about white supremacy and the way that we've been inculcated into that system, but also ways to talk about it and deal with it um, as a white person and as a person of color. Um, and then you can, oops, sorry, I lost, lost our slide. All right, anyway, um, I'll, just, I'll just say the last couple of resources. Um, another one is a, a podcast by Seen on Radio called Seeing White, and it will teach you the history of whiteness that you probably never learned um, in school. You will learn that white whiteness, the identity of being white, was created to perpetuate slavery. It was not a thing, it's just a thing that was invented, among many other things that you will learn. So learn and educate yourself about who we are as a country. And then another resource that I really like is Ijoma Oluo's uh, book, So You Want to Talk About Race. All this stuff I'm talking about, I see a lot of crossed arms <laughs> in this audience. I see a lot of really uncomfortable people because this is very uncomfortable. I've had to be uncomfortable with this too, right? Like I've had to unpack my own internalized white supremacy and the way that I look at black America and the way that I look at white America as a developer and as a human to be a better developer, to be a better human. I've had to do this work and it fucking sucks. It like feels like a tightness in my chest and I want to run away from it every time I, I come towards it. But we can talk about these things, and they're tools. So you want to talk about race is a really good book to use that. So, you know, just tie it all together. Ethics means nothing until we dismantle these systems. Um, we, can, we, we, we still need to keep them in mind. We can still learn from our history. We can learn from the people that built these systems. But I think our number one obligation is not to write more code. Um, our number one obligation is to deal with this extremely pressing problem that has plagued us for many years that we continue to sort of, like, push under the rug. It's, it's not going to go away. We have to deal with it, and that happens on an individual level. So thank you all for having me.